Emma Calvey found in the role of Sappho the opportunity for her most incomparable and most characteristic creation, wrote the critic Henri de Courson in 1922, nearly 25 years after Calvey had performed the leading part in Jules Massenet's Sappho. As de Courson further explained, it was as if there were two beings in her, one entirely on the surface, another that gradually unveiled the depths of her soul. This one, in the slightest intonations, in the smallest gestures, emanated entirely from race, entirely from peasant nature. Such a description might have surprised readers with no memory of Calvé's acclaimed performances of this work. Indeed, the role she played in Massenet's opera was not that of a peasant, but rather a Parisian artist model of a certain age named Fanny Legrand, better known as Sappho after posing for a statue of the Greek poetess. Based on Provençal writer Alphonse Daudet's 1884 novel, which Daudet and Adolphe Bellot had transformed into a play in 1885, Massenet's naturalistic opera told the tale of an ill-fated affair between Sappho and a young man only recently arrived in Paris from Avignon, Jean Garcin. The music of Massenet's opera amplified the disparity between these two characters. Sappho's realm resounds with the noisy dance music of the Moulin Rouge and the Folie Bergère, Jean's with Provençal songs. In a pivotal scene in Act Two, though, Sappho attempts to bridge this divide by singing Frédéric Mistral's famous Provençal song, the Chanson de Magali, to Jean. As Stephen Hubner has, has observed, this song, quote, does not belong to Thani or Sappho inasmuch as she was not born in the Midi, end quote. But this song did belong to Calvé, who had been born in the department of Aveyron and had recently purchased a chateau in the neighboring Erol. It was with her performance of the Chanson de Magali, I suggest, that Calvé unveiled the depths of her soul, to recall de Courson's words, singing not as Sappho, but as herself, a woman who, despite her international stardom, sought to remain rooted in the regional culture of Provence. In both of the memoirs she published later in life, Calvé wrote extensively of her attachment to the south of France. But in 1897, when she premiered Massenet's Sappho, the singer had only begun to cultivate a public persona that emphasized her regional identity. Tracing Calvé's interpretations of the Chanson de Magali from the operatic stage to regionalist events to the recording studio, my paper today examines how the singer fashioned herself as a Provençal artist in the late 1890s and early 1900s. Ultimately, I argue that performing Mistral's song allowed Calvé to assert her authority as a singer, to exercise control over her public image, and perhaps most crucially, to affiliate herself with the people and place of her birth, all as she pursued a globalized and heavily commercialized performing career. In January 1897, Massenet wrote to Calvé, who was then performing in New York, I also assure you that I have but one thought, Sappho, Calvé. The hyphen here hints at Massenet's extensive efforts to tailor this role to Calvé's vocal and dramatic abilities. Over the past year, the composer and singer had worked together closely despite their geographical distance. Indeed, if Arthur Wisner's 1902 biography of Calvé is to be believed, Massenet frequently mailed sketches of the opera to the singer while she was in the United States, uh, to which she responded with cylinder recordings of her performing these pages, made using the phonograph with which she traveled from the mid-1890s onward. Neither sketches nor cylinders survive, but Massenet's autograph score bears tangible traces of their collaborative authorship, including Calvé's signature on the final page of the manuscript. Calvé's influence emerges most clearly in the second scene of Act II, in which Sappho wins over Jean's heart by performing the Chanson de Magali. Mistral's song had played no part in Daudet's novel, 
and only a minor one in Dodé and Bello's subsequent play, in which Sappho hears Jean sing the Chanson de Magali and later sings it back to him to little dramatic effect. In Massonet's version, though, Mistral's song becomes a crucial, if curious, dramaturgical device. Sappho's performance of the Chanson de Magali prompts Jean to express his love for her, but Henri Quint and Artur Bernet's libretto fails to explain how the Parisian artist model has come to learn this Provençal song. Audiences largely overlooked this flaw in the plot. Calvet's performances of the Chanson de Magali were so regularly encored that Léon Carvalot included special instructions in case of future encores in his published Mise en Scène book. Critics, however, were less charitable. Shortly after the premiere, Ernest Schreier wrote of this scene. How did the Chanson de Magali find its way there? And where did Sappho learn it in the familiar idiom of the beautiful daughters of Méan or saint Rémy? Well, I am not too sure. Another critic bluntly suggested that Mistral's song functioned as nothing more than an insertion aria for Calvé, writing that solely in order to have the pleasure of hearing it sung by Mademoiselle Calvé, the librettists have inserted the Chanson de Magali, for which Monsieur Massonet has respected the melody popular in Avignon. Calvé later recalled that in the middle of the melodious phrases only the master can write, Massonet introduced Mistral's celebrated Magali, which I sing in all of my concerts. And here, her proprietary language suggests that she, too, envisioned this song as a sort of suitcase aria. Taken together, the evidence suggests that Calvé had a hand in shaping this scene, ensuring that she would sing the Chanson de Magali on the stage of the Opéra Comique, whether or not it made sense for her character to do so. Calvé's creative involvement extended beyond the insertion of Mistral's song to encompass elements of performance practice. In her 1922 memoir, the singer wrote that Massenet's Sappho had allowed her to make use of the, quote, special and individual notes in my voice, unquote, which she elsewhere described as her fourth voice, an exquisitely quiet flageolet or flute register that Calvé claimed she had learned to access after studying with the Italian castrato Domenico Mustafa. In both of her later recordings of scenes from this opera, Calvé made use of this flute register. If we compare these moments in Calvé's recordings with the corresponding passages of Massonet's autograph score, we can see that the composer's manner of indicating flute notes is precise, but quite minimalistic suggesting that Massonet was aware of how Calvé planned to sing such notes and perhaps had no need to provide further performance markings. In the final measure of the Chanson de Magali, as elsewhere in the opera, the high B-flat flute note, which comes at the end of a pianissimo line, is simply marked with another pianissimo. With their working relationship in mind, I'd like to propose that Massonet's autograph score described rather than prescribed Calvé's performance practices, perhaps reflecting sounds he had first heard on a cylinder recording sent across the ocean. Calvé's occasional ascent into this register within the context of Sappho drew much attention, and each critic had a different way of articulating what he heard. What one describes as a voice with, an, with such soft halftones, another portrays as a voice of crystalline timbre, and another still as spun sounds, high notes of such sweetness and purity that hearing them is a true treat of which one never wearies. The final seconds of Calvé's only extant recording of the Chanson de Magali, which she made in 1902 for the Gramophone and Typewriter Company, and which closely matches Massonet's markings in his autograph score, offer a glimpse into what critics may have heard in 1897. And I'd like to play this for you now. Um, at the very beginning of this excerpt, you can hear Calvé tell her accompanist to stop playing, probably so that her flute note could actually be uh, picked up in the recording. <laughs>
Salve's use of this highly distinctive vocal technique further distanced her performance of the Chanson de Magali from the fictional world of the opera, prompting listeners to hear the singer rather than Sappho. Why did Calve make such efforts to perform as herself in this scene, momentarily disrupting Massenet's hyphenation of Calve with her character? The answer to this question lies, I would argue, in Calve's emerging desire to affiliate herself with her region and with those who had taken on the cause of salvaging the language and traditions of the Midi. Over the past few decades, regionalist societies, including the Fele Brige, founded in Provence in 1854 by Mistral and six other authors, as well as La Cigale and the Société des Félibres de Paris, both established in the 1870s by Provençal uh, immigrants to the capital, had sought to reinvigorate the Provençal idiom, the Languedoc, and to promote the region's culture, including its songs. In 1887, the Parisian regionalist organizations joined forces to publish a collection of traditional folk songs with new lyrics written by Philippe and Sigalier, including, as its first selection, Mistral Chanson de Magali. As Sabine toulon lardic has recently discussed, Provençal chansons occasionally made their way into 19th century uh, French operatic works, where these songs typically helped to associate a protagonist with his or her region, or to evoke a geographic location with a degree of ethnographic accuracy. In large part, Massenet's use of the chanson de Magali in Sappho did just this by demonstrating Jean's attachment to Provence at the outset of Act Two, and by establishing the soundscape of the Avignon countryside at the beginning of Act Four. But Calvé's performance of the Chanson de Magali fell outside of such conventions purposely and noticeably. Indeed, at least one critic recognized this moment as a kind of regionalist project on the part of the performer. The critic for L'Avenir Artistique suggested that Calvé's performance of the song and her use of her special notes demonstrated her commitment to the Félibrige, writing that to prove her capacities as a good Félibre, she sang in half tones and without accompaniment the Provençal Chanson de Magali, O Magali ma tanto amado, which earned her enthusiastic curtain calls. To put all of this more plainly, I'm suggesting that Calvé's use of her distinctive vocal technique in this scene signaled a step out of character, as did her, performance, uh, her decision to perform this song in the first place, and that the singer did so in an effort to further the regionalist cause. Calvé's performance of this song at the Opéra Comique positioned her as a friend of the Fele Brige. Just days after Calvé participated in the premiere of Sappho, La Cigale invited the singer to preside over their monthly dinner, quote, in her capacity as a daughter of Aveyron, end quote. As Le Figaro reported, the president of La Cigale, the painter Benjamin Constant, described Calvé as, quote, a peasant woman and a compatriot as well as a great artist, end quote, before asking her to reprise the Chanson de Magali. In 1909, the official secretary to the Philippe Paul Marietton, asked Calvé to sing at a celebration to be held in Arles in honor of the 50th anniversary of Mistral's Mireo. According to Comedia, Calvé's appearance in traditional Arlesienne garb was met with enthusiastic, quote, enthusiastic cheers rolling like thunder, a thousand voices shouting as only southern voices know how to yell, Calvé, 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 end quote. After a B-flat chord sounded on a piano, Calvé performed the Chanson de Magali just as she had done, quote, when she created Massenet's Sappho at the Opéra Comique, end quote. And here you can see the two images of Calvé that accompanied the write-up in Comedia, uh, Rutlinger's photo of Calvé as Sappho and a number, another of Calvé dressed as an Arlesienne. 
In the decade that followed her premiere of Sappho, Calvé returned frequently to the Chanson de Magali, especially in her first few professional recording sessions. Indeed, this song was one of only a handful of selections Calvé chose to record multiple times, and it remained the only Provençal song she ever recorded over the course of her 20-year recording career. As early as June 1898, an advertisement in the phonoscope alerted American consumers that Calvé had recorded her voice in the New York laboratory of inventor and socialite Gianni Bettini. Bettini's April 1900 catalog provided further details. For the exceptionally high price of $5, consumers could purchase one of two recordings made by Calvé, including what it described as the Magali Aria, Provençal song inserted in Sappho. In 1902, Calvé recorded six selections for the gramophone and typewriter company in London, including popular arias from Georges Bizet's Carmen and Pietro Mascagni's Cavalleria Rusticana, two melodies by Massenet, and the Chanson de Magali, identified only as Magali Chanson Provençale in the 1904 International Artist Catalog released by the company's French affiliate. In 1908, Calvé again recorded the Chanson de Magali, along with several arias and duets, melody, and folk songs, this time for the Victor Talking Machine Company. Uh, and unfortunately, this version of the Chanson de Magali has been lost and was apparently never released um, publicly. The Chanson de Magali held a special place in Calvé's recording repertoire, and her choice to repeatedly record this song suggests a keen awareness of the way certain pieces and the phonograph could be marshaled in the service of self-fashioning. Over the course of her career, technologies of mass reproduction ensured that Calvé's voice and image circulated globally. Phonograph recordings, photo biographies, cabinet cards, and magazine advertisements representing the singer in her most famous roles proliferated. But Calvé was no passive participant in this process. Rather, as I've argued in this paper and as I discuss more fully in the longer version of this project, Calvé was both aware of how these technologies affected her career and active in harnessing them. To offer but one additional example, Calvé frequently provided photographs of herself working the land and tending the animals at her estate at Cabaret to journalists and biographers, balancing out and in some cases outstripping the Carmens and the Sapphos. And here you can see one of these photographs. Situating Calvé's recording of the Chanson de Magali within this larger project of self-fashioning thus sheds light on how the singer co-opted the means of mass commodification for her own ends, just as she had Massenet's opera. Calvé's frequent return to this and other folk songs also seems to have served another, more personal purpose. Though clearly proud of the career she had built, in her writings and her interviews, she tended toward wistfulness, lamenting that she was often obliged to be away from the place in the world she loved the best. In an interview with the writer Paul Acker, Calvé confessed, quote, I am a woman uprooted, unquote, and then regaled him with a chanson, as she often did in conversations with reporters. He concluded his article by noting that he would have stayed for hours to listen to Calvé sing, but, by, but the time all too quickly arrived for her to prepare for that evening's stage performance. In his final paragraph, Acker wrote, quote, the peasant Chatelain of Cabrier disappeared, leaving the room to the artist, unquote. The tension between the peasant and the artist remained a constant in Calvé's life, but performing the songs of Provence allowed her to inhabit, if only for a moment, a part of her all too often submerged in the service of her art. Thank you very much. <laughs> 